Our scripture reading is Acts chapter 26. Acts chapter 26. Paul is in prison in Caesarea. He has not been transferred yet to Rome. He has appealed to Caesar. And now he has this opportunity to explain his matter before some of the magistrates. Acts chapter 26. Then Agrippa said unto Paul, Thou art permitted to speak for thyself. Then Paul stretched forth the hand and answered for himself. I think myself happy, King Agrippa, because I shall answer for myself this day before thee, touching all the things whereof I am accused of the Jews, especially because I know thee to be expert in all customs and questions which are among the Jews. Wherefore, I beseech thee to hear me patiently. My manner of life from my youth, which was at the first among mine own nation at Jerusalem, know all the Jews, which knew me from the beginning, if they would testify that after the most straightest sect of our religion I lived, a Pharisee. And now I stand and am judged for the hope of the promise made of God unto our fathers, unto which promise our twelve tribes, instantly serving God day and night, hope to come, for which hope's sake, King Agrippa, I am accused of the Jews. Why should it be thought a thing incredible with you that God should raise the dead? I verily thought with myself that I ought to do many things contrary to the name of Jesus Christ, Jesus of Nazareth, which thing I also did in Jerusalem. And many of the saints did I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priests. And when they were put to death, I gave my voice against them. And I punished them oft in every synagogue, and compelled them to blaspheme. And being exceedingly mad against them, I persecuted them even into strange cities." Whereupon, as I went to Damascus with authority and commission from the chief priests, at midday, O king, I saw in the way a light from heaven, above the brightness of the sun, shining round about me and them which journeyed with me. When we were all fallen to the earth, I heard a voice speaking unto me and saying in the Hebrew tongue, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And I said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. But rise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness, both of these things which thou hast seen, and of those things in the which I will appear unto thee, delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom now I send thee, to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me." Whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision, but showed first unto them of Damascus and at Jerusalem and throughout all the coasts of Judea, and then to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God and do works meet for repentance. And for these causes, the Jews caught me in the temple and went about to kill me. Having therefore obtained help of God, I continue unto this day, witnessing both to small and great, saying none other things than those which the prophets and Moses did say should come, that Christ should suffer, that he should be the first that should rise from the dead and should show light 
unto the people and to the Gentiles. And as he thus spake for himself, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, thou art beside thyself. Much learning doth make thee mad. But he said, I am not mad, most noble Festus, but speak forth the words of truth and soberness. For the king knoweth of these things, before whom also I speak freely. For I am persuaded that none of these things are hidden from him. For this thing was not done in a corner. King Agrippa, believest thou the prophets? I know that thou believest. Then Agrippa said unto Paul, Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. And Paul said, I would to God that not only thou, but also all that hear me this day were both almost and altogether such as I am, except these bonds. And when he had thus spoken, the king rose up, and the governor, and Bernice, and they that sat with them. And when they were gone aside, they talked between themselves, saying, This man doeth nothing worthy of death or of bonds. Then said Agrippa unto Festus, This man might have been set at liberty if he had not appealed unto Caesar. So far we read God's holy word. The text for the sermon is verse 29. And Paul said, I would to God that not only thou, but also all that hear me this day were both almost and altogether such as I am, except these bonds. Beloved in the Lord Jesus Christ, have you ever consciously desired that someone who was clearly an unbeliever, even an ungodly unbeliever, that that person would be converted, turn from their sin, and become a child of God? Almost everyone has family of which they would say something like that, or friends who have departed from the faith, and it is a grief of heart that they have done so, and we earnestly desire and even pray that God would turn them and bring them back. But I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about someone that was a stranger to us previously, Someone that we're thrown together with and we have opportunity to witness concerning Jesus Christ. Or maybe a fellow laborer at work. Someone that God brings into our life. That we would say about that individual who is clearly an unbeliever, clearly is not living a godly life. I would to God that you were a Christian that you are a Christian. The Apostle Paul did. In this chapter, we read of how Paul stood before the Roman governors. Festus was the governor at this time. And it's not the first time he has defended himself. It's happened a number of times. But he has, in, at this point, in a sense, nothing is at stake as he speaks here. Because... He had appealed to Caesar because it seemed that the governor was going to turn him over to the Jews and let the Jews try him, and Paul knew that that would mean death. So he appealed to Caesar. He had that right as a Roman citizen, and he would be sent off to Rome. But now that he had appealed to Caesar, he could not be condemned by either Agrippa or by Festus. He was on his way to Rome. The hearing that he has here arises out of a visit that King Agrippa, king of the northern region, Galilee and surrounding regions, King Agrippa had, he visited this Festus, a newly appointed governor, with Agrippa's sister Bernice to pay their respects to the new governor. But Festus had a problem, and that is he had to send Paul off to Rome but he had to write down what is the charge against him. 
What's the crime that this man has committed? And he knew that Paul had done absolutely nothing against Roman law. The Jews only wanted to kill him because of some religious thing, which he did not understand. And he had no idea what to put down on the charge. But Agrippa, who had some Jewish blood in him, perhaps would be able to understand what was going on here and, and give him the charge to put down for sending Paul off to Rome. So Agrippa is very interested. We don't know why. Was he perhaps just curious? He had heard about this, this Paul or something of this new religion. Perhaps he had an evil motive that he, if he would join in condemning Paul, he would gain favor with the Jews. Maybe he wanted to learn something of this new religion so that he could be one that would combat it. Whatever the reason, maybe just curiosity, he said, sure, I'd, I'd like to hear Paul speak. So they set a time for Paul to come together with Festus and Agrippa and Bernice and soldiers and noblemen that were gathered together to hear Paul's defense. Agrippa takes over the meeting, and he says in verse 1, Thou art permitted to speak for thyself. Paul is in no way intimidated by this august crowd. and With the boldness that the Holy Spirit gives him, he stretches out the hand, as an orator would do, and he addresses the nobles and the rulers of the land, and he gives a defense of himself. In his defense, he first of all said, My life is above reproach. I have lived the strictest life of a Pharisee. I have kept the law blameless as far as the Jews are concerned. So that's not the reason they have to accuse me. The real issue, he said, is that I believe in the resurrection from the dead. But that's the hope of Israel. That's what the prophets have talked about, that there would be a resurrection. So this is not really anything new that I'm preaching, even to the Jews. But then it seems, about verse 8, that the whole speech of Paul changes. Instead of defending himself, he now has as his, in view to convince those who are sitting there, Agrippa and others, that in fact, Jesus arose from the dead. In verse 8 we read, Why should it be thought a thing incredible with you that God should raise the dead? And he goes on to prove that Jesus arose from the dead by the fact that he saw a vision of Jesus who spoke to him out of heaven and commissioned him to be a preacher and an apostle. It is an authoritative speech. It's a bold speech. It's setting forth the gospel of Jesus Christ. The effect of Paul's words, first of all, upon Festus, is that Festus finally interrupts him and says, Paul, thou art beside thyself. You're crazy. You're out of your mind. You're talking foolishness. Paul says, I am not mad. The words that I speak, I speak in truth and soberness. I'm not crazy. I'm not out of my mind. And then he turns to Agrippa, and he says, King Agrippa, believest thou the prophets? He presses Agrippa. Do you believe the prophets about the resurrection? At that point, Agrippa says, Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. It's hard to know exactly what Agrippa meant. Because literally, he says, in a little, in a little, thou persuadest me. Now, he might be saying, oh, in just a little way, you have persuaded me. And so he's kind of mocking the apostle. Or he might be saying, in a little bit of time, in a little bit of time, you want to persuade me to be a Christian? You think I'm just going to believe this just from your little speech here today in this little bit of time? Either way, it's clear he was not receiving the gospel. He was not believing it. Paul's answer is striking, and that's the words of the text. I would to God that not only in a little, but in a great way, that you and everyone here 
was exactly as I am, that is a Christian, that is a good desire. It's a right desire to look at an ungodly man and say, this is my desire, that you would be as I am, a Christian. If that's a good desire for the Apostle Paul, that's equally a good desire for us as well. So let's examine this text under the theme, desiring the salvation of the ungodly. Desiring the salvation of the ungodly. Well, notice in the first place the earnest desire expressed by Paul. I would to God. Earnest desire. Secondly, the energetic response or the energetic effect, I mean, the effect that this has on Paul. This desire he has, but now this is carried out in his life. And then third, the approved effort. Where I will set forth that this is something God approves. So first of all, the earnest desire, desiring the salvation of the ungodly, it starts with the apostle saying, I would to God. Now what does that mean, I would to God? We don't really usually talk that way. But what does Paul mean by that? When Paul uses the words there, I would to God, he is saying either I wish to God, or that word is even translated a number of times in the Bible, I pray to God. Paul is not making an idle wish here. He's not sim simply speaking words that have no meaning in order to sound good. I stand before God, and this is my desire. I give this desire to God. That's what he's saying. And who is he saying that about? That not only thou, King Agrippa, who is king of the northern region of Judea and so on, of Galilee, but all that hear me this day, Festus the governor, Bernice, the captains, the nobles, I would that all of you were almost and all together, is how the King James puts it. But now remember how King Agrippa said, in a little, Paul takes that same word and he says, this is my desire that you would now in a little while, yes, right now, I don't have in mind that you think about this for a couple of years. I have in mind that you face the question right here and now, that right now in this little bit of time, on the basis of what I have said, this is what I'm saying, right now, in a little, and all together means in a great way. Not that you are a little bit persuaded, but that you are in fact completely persuaded of what I have said to you, that you would be very much like me. Not, of course, with the bonds, not with the chains that are on Paul's arms. I don't want you to be slaves, but I want you to be as I am, that is, to be a Christian. To be converted. That's what Paul was. He was a converted Christian from his unbelief to believing in Jesus. That's what I want you to be. Someone who is repenting of his sin. Someone who is believing and confessing Jesus Christ. Someone who embraces the gospel with his whole heart. That's my desire. Where does that desire come from? Why does, why does Paul say this to this ungodly man that I desire that you be exactly as I am? Where does that desire come from? And I'm going to point out three things that gives Paul this tremendous desire. In the first place, he is being faithful to his calling as a preacher, as a minister. And what it meant to be a preacher and, and a great love for the work that God has given him as a minister of the gospel. He expresses that earlier in the chapter when he points out that Jesus said, I am, I'm going to, I've appeared to you for this purpose to make you a minister and a witness of the things that you've seen and the things that I will tell you. And then that I will send you to the Gentiles, he says in verse 18, to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. This is the 
This is the call of Paul to the work of being a, a minister of the gospel. That's what it is for every faithful minister. The ministry is not a position of prestige. The ministry is not a place where he gets to stand and be above everybody and have everybody look up to the man that is a minister. That's not what the position is. It's not a way to get rich. It's not a way to have honor among people, to impress people with his learning, or to move them with his oratory so that they feel deep emotions. It's not that he calls people to social action. The work of a minister is the salvation of souls and the care of those souls. That's what a minister is called to do. That's what this chapter clearly indicates. And Paul, in his work as a minister, demonstrated that. In one place he writes to the Thessalonians, I was like a nurse with you. So much I cared for you. I was like a nurse taking care of a little baby. That's my devotion to you, to the care of your souls. That's what a minister does. He's interested. He's, he's zealous for the salvation of souls. In the second place, so that's the first place where that desire comes from as he stands before Agrippa. It's his work to save souls. Secondly, it is arising out of a love for the neighbor. A love for the neighbor. Who is the neighbor? The neighbor is someone that God puts right on your path. You don't have to go way far away to find the neighbor. The neighbor is right there, the one God puts right on your path, who clearly needs help. And God puts him right there, says, there it is, there's your neighbor. Now, demonstrate love for the neighbor. God brought Paul into this situation, in this room with people that he never in his life thought he would ever meet, let alone have op the opportunity to speak to. Did they have need? They most assuredly did. The need that they had was the greatest need of all, that is, the need of salvation. Paul was standing in a room, almost certainly, of total unbelievers, every one of them. And we're not talking about mild and meek unbelievers. We're talking about the wealthy. We're talking about people who had the money to go after the things that they wanted. Let me tell you a little bit about them. Agrippa and Bernice were a brother and sister who were children of one of the Herods. The Herod that had put James the Apostle to death, put Peter, Peter in prison, and it was so proud that when he gave a speech to the people, and the people foolishly honored him, saying, It's the voice of a God and not of man. He was so filled with pride at that point that God smote him with worms that he died. That's their father. Their grandfather was the Herod who put John the Baptist to death. Their great-grandfather was the Herod who killed the babies of Bethlehem at the time of Jesus' birth. You, you see, they're in a line of some very, very wicked men. And now to make it worse, they are living in unspeakable immorality, a brother and a sister living as though they are husband and wife. That's the man Paul addressed. Everybody knew it. Everybody knew he was living in that sin. Festus knew it. And so here's Festus, his friend, who doesn't rebuke Agrippa and Bernice for their immorality, but allows them to come into his home and visit him. And the nobles and the soldiers are all gathered to there, to there and Paul says about them, you know what you need? You need salvation. That's your great need. And he doesn't ignore that. He comes out of a love for the neighbor that God has put in his path. And he brings them the gospel. You see, a love for the neighbor is not something that is to be forced on a believer. We don't have to be commanded, now love your neighbor. Although that command is there. 
But it comes upon it comes upon a believer because of the great salvation that God has given to him and to her. Paul says, knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Yes, he knows the terror of the Lord. He knows that he was on his way to hell. He was on the path that leads to hell. But God delivered him and showed him mercy. And now his earnest desire is to tell other people, you understand there is a day of judgment coming. You understand that your sins will convict you and you will spend eternity in hell. He wants them to know that, that they will turn. And he also knows how totally unworthy he was. It never ceased to amaze Paul that God would take him, a blasphemer and a man who persecuted the church, and take him and deliver him and save him. So Paul, you see, would never look around and say, well, that man, he's not worthy of the gospel. He'll never listen. We can kind of have that attitude. We don't live the way the world does. We believe the gospel. They never will. Paul never said that about anyone. That, oh, they, they never will. He would condemn them after they rejected the gospel. But he didn't go up to someone saying, well, this man is so sinful, there's no point in me even giving a witness to him. Here is Agrippa. He brings the gospel because he has a love for the neighbor that God set in front of him. So it arises out of his understanding of his calling as a minister. It arises, secondly, out of his love for the neighbor. But in the third place, it arises out of his love for God and for God's glory. That's Paul's greatest motive. Because you understand that the salvation of every sinner, you and me and anyone else in the world, the salvation of every sinner results in a sinner who will praise God eternally. Eternally. Because salvation is a greater work than anything else that God does. It demonstrates His power. We think creation is marvelous, and it is that God could simply speak the Word and call into existence the heavens and the earth. But salvation is even greater than that, because in salvation, God takes that which is dead and calls out life. God takes that which is corrupt and vile and makes it to be that which is holy. He takes a sinner who is devoted, dead in sin, and he makes that sinner to want to obey God and to begin to walk in obedience. That's the power of the saving work of God. That work redounds to the glory of God. That's the purpose. It's a testimony. Every saint, saint who is a sinner, every sinner made into a saint, is a living, breathing testimony to the power of God's sovereign grace. And Paul desires that. That motivated Paul more than anything. That God would be glorified. So this is his desire. I would to God that you were not even a little, but that you were completely as I am, except for these bonds. Notice that Paul's desire for the salvation of these ungodly people in front of him does not in any way compromise the truth. It does not compromise the truth. You think of all the books that are in the New Testament, which books emphasize the sovereign grace of God the most? And the answer is the ones that Paul wrote under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He preached sovereign grace. He preached predestination in Ephesians and in Romans. He preached 
predestination to the people. Very, very clear that, that God rejects some to eternal destruction, that he saves some, he chooses some unto eternal life. In the book of Romans, chapter 9, Romans 9, that's where you have this, for example, in verse 11, the children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God, according to election, might stand not of works, but of him that calleth, God's powerful call. And then in verse 15, for he said to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. It's all of God. Now we all know that, but do you remember how that chapter started? Listen to how he started chapter 9. I say the truth in Christ, I lie not. My conscience also bury me witness in the Holy Ghost that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. How come? Why was he sorrowful? For I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh, my fellow Israelites who do not believe in Jesus. It breaks my heart. And then he goes into election. He explains why many of them are not believing and why only some of them are believing. And then chapter 10 begins this way. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. So here he is. He's setting forth the doctrine of predestination as clearly as you'll find it anywhere in the Bible. But on both ends of that is this desire that Israel may be saved. My kinsmen, according to the flesh. He's not compromising, though he has that desire. He doesn't deny total depravity in this very chapter which we read he speaks of the fact that the Gentiles are in darkness, in verse 18. They're under the power of Satan, that they may receive forgiveness of sins. He knows that. He doesn't minimize sin. He doesn't in any way minimize the depravity of man. He taught limited atonement, that is, that Jesus died not for the whole world, but that he died for the elect. Paul preached sovereign grace. And then he said this, and understand that my preaching is not an offer, that I do not come and beg people to believe and that I say God wants to save you. That's not what it is. He said, this is what my preaching is. I preach Christ crucified. It will harden some. It will save some. That's what preaching is. No offer, no compromise. And yet, though he preached sovereign particular grace, he said, I would to God that you were as I, a Christian. Obviously, we may not compromise the gospel and the truth in any way either, but we still must have this desire. And this desire will arise out of really the same threefold source that it did for Paul. Number one, understanding our calling. We're not preachers. We're not all preachers, but we are redeemed. We've been saved. And we've been saved in order to praise God. Already in the Old Testament, God said this to Israel in, in Isaiah 43, verse 12. I have declared and have saved and have showed when there was no strange God among you. I demonstrated my power when there was no idol among you. Therefore ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord, that I am God. That's what we are. We are witnesses that Jehovah is God. Now a witness testifies. That's what he does. He speaks. He demonstrates. We are His witnesses. This is our calling. We're prophets given the Holy Spirit who are called to be a witness at all times. At all times in our lives. 
Secondly, this love, this desire that Paul has and should be in our hearts arises out of a love for the neighbor, the same as Paul. A love for the neighbor, the knowledge that God has saved us who are most unworthy sinners, that God has loved us. And now when God puts someone on our path who clearly needs the truth of the gospel spoken to him, we take a real interest in that person. We take a spiritual interest in that person. We want to, have, to look for the opportunity to witness about Jesus Christ because we have a love for the neighbor, the one that God puts right in our path. And then third, it arises out of our love for God. Because we must keep in mind that the salvation of every single sinner redounds to the glory of God. It doesn't give glory to us. If God would be pleased to use one of us to lead someone to the truth and God would use that even to convert that individual, we didn't save him. God saves, and the glory goes to Him. So we labor to bring an unbeliever to the knowledge of the truth, to that saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, that He may give glory to God. If that sounds a little odd in a Protestant Reformed church, then let me remind you of something that the canons of Dort tell us to do. In the canons of Dort, third and fourth head, Article 15, it talks about what should be our attitude towards other people. And it starts with what should be our attitude towards each other. And it says, as far as believers in the church, those who make a confession of faith, and live normal lives, we are to be charitable. We are to deal with them and view them in the most favorable manner. But then it says toward the end of Article 15 this, As to others who have not yet been called. Now they've heard the preaching, they've heard the external call, but they have not yet been called. They have not received the internal call. They're not saved. What should we do about them? It is our duty to pray for them to God. That's our duty, to pray to them, for them, to God, who calls the things that are not as if they were. But we are in no wise to conduct ourselves toward them with haughtiness, as if we have made ourselves to differ. Now, if you study that article, the emphasis is on people in the church who might not have the assurance of salvation and say, I'm not called, I'm not a believer. And our attitude should be, we pray for them, that God will call them. But if I may do that for someone here who's not saved, I may do the same for my unbelieving neighbor. Pray to them, for them, pray to God for them. That's what Paul is doing here. It's that desire. That desire produces an energizing effect. Paul does not express here a mere wish, something that's fervently expressed but uh, soon forgotten, and it really has no effect on his life. This desire of the Apostle Paul propelled him into action. It, com it compelled him. Listen to verse 19. Whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision. Jesus called me to be an apostle to the Gentiles, to those who knew nothing about God. I was not disobedient. That's a negative way of saying, that's what I did. I preached. I brought the gospel to every unbeliever I could possibly find. And he did. And he preached the whole counsel of God. And he preached Christ crucified. That was the content of his preaching. He never compromised. He never watered down the preaching because he understood that 
His opinions didn't save anyone. The only thing that saves anyone is the truth of God. So he brought the truth as powerfully, as clearly as he possibly could because God uses the truth to save his people. He was a servant of Jesus Christ, a slave even. He would say that often. I'm not here to please men. My one duty is to be obedient to Jesus Christ. So to every man that he could and at every opportunity, in Acts 20 he says, I, went, I preached publicly. I went house to house. I did everything I could to, to give them the gospel of Jesus Christ. He did that in, in different ways. To the Jews, he would speak in a certain way, as he writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, Unto the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might gain the Jew. To them that are under the law as those that are under the law. To those that are outside the laws, I, I preach differently to them. Why? In verse 22 of, chapter, of 1 Corinthians 9, I am made all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. That's his desire. It governed his life. He not only was willing and eager to preach every place he could, but he was willing to suffer for the sake of that message. He said, I bear the marks of the apostle." I have suffered greatly. You can read his list of suffering, astounding. I bear the marks of the apostle. I carry the scars of my persecution. Why did he do that? For the sake of the salvation of the elect who were out there among the unbelievers. For the sake of the elect. He wrote that to, the, to Timothy he said, the gospel that I preach, it carries a reproach. You have to understand that. So it says in, in 2 Timothy 2, verse 9, Where therefore I endure all things for the elect's sake, that they may obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. What a power that is. What a power. When a man is willing to endure the kind of suffering that the Apostle Paul did and to get up and do it again and to go away and do it some more, what a power. Everyone looks at him and says, why is he doing that? He must be convicted of the message that he's bringing. God uses that willingness to suffer as a testimony to the conviction of the man and to the power of the preaching. That's what it must be in us, you see. If we have such a desire as Paul has, and we must, this is a good desire, then it must be expressed in our lives too. It cannot be simply that we say, oh, I agree with Paul. And I certainly do desire this, uh, the man living next door or someone else that God puts on my path. I certainly do desire his salvation, but it never has any effect on our lives. And it's, then it's empty. Then it's empty. And that means we have a desire to publish the truth we want the preaching to go forth. We want the preaching right here in this pulpit to be preaching that's true to the Bible because that's the only thing that saves, the truth. And we want that preaching to go out so that from our congregation there is a serious effort to get the word out. Church does this locally, but it, the church also does it denominationally so that there is a zeal within our hearts for the work of the Foreign Mission Committee, for the work of the Domestic Mission Committee, that the Word continues to go out to gather God's people. We want it to go out not only by the preaching from here and from the other pulpits and the mission fields, but we want it to go out in our own lives, that there's a testimony that comes out of 
our own lives. Jesus said that to his disciples in Matthew chapter 5, verse 16. Let your light so shine before men. The light of the gospel. Let it shine that they may behold your good works. And then what? And glorify God. And the only way they'll glorify God is if they're changed from their unbelief to faith. That's what, you're, that's what Jesus said. Let your works, let your life be a constant testimony to the power of God's grace, to the great salvation that we have in Jesus Christ. Let your life shine in that way. But then, open your mouth. Talk about it. Let people know that there's something that is a hope within you, a hope of salvation. Paul had a hope of the resurrection. We have a hope of the resurrection. Let that come out so that it will happen as we read in 1 Peter 3, 15. Sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is within you. You have an opportunity. They just ask you, what, what's your hope? Why are you expecting that? All of us are discouraged about life, and you're living here, but you have a hope. What's your hope? Be ready to give an answer so that you don't say to them, well, I, I don't know. I, I don't know the Bible very well. I can take you to my minister, though. You be ready to give an answer. That's what the Bible tells us. And that means a willingness to suffer for Jesus' sake. A willingness to suffer. To stand for the cause of God's truth. No matter what the consequences. If it brings hatred and strife into your life, you're willing for the sake of the truth to endure that. If it turns friends against you, if it turns parents against you, if it turns children against you, if it turns your fellow workers against you, you're willing to live with that. You're willing to live with that. God uses that. That shows that the gospel that you talk about is something that really means that much to you. I won't give this up. I may lose my job. But I will not give this up. It means that much to me. So we want people to see that. We don't have to be antagonistic. We don't have to go out of our way to be obnoxious. The point is not, I'm going to prove to you that my church is right. That's not the point. The point is, let me tell you about the gospel. Let me tell you about Jesus Christ. That's what I want you to hear. And even if it means persecution. With Paul, we say, I want you to be as I am. And what does that mean? Really, it means I want you to be Protestant Reformed. I want you to hold on to the same truth that I have. I want you to know the great salvation that I'm enjoying. The covenant. Sovereign grace. I want you to be as I am. That, you see, is the energizing effect. Those who have the desire, would to God, that you are as I am. It motivates, it compels to a certain lifestyle and to a willingness to witness. And then the third place, that is something approved of God. It's an approved effort. God will use it. That's what I mean by it being approved. God will use it. That testimony, He certainly will use the preaching. God's Word is powerful. And in Isaiah 55, 11, He said, So shall my word be. It shall not return to me void, 
It will accomplish that which I please. Whatever God determines, His Word will accomplish what He wants it to accomplish. And from that point of view, whatever the effect of that Word is, that's what God intended. That's why He approves it. Because the Word of God has a twofold effect. It hardens. It kills. It drives away. But God has determined that already. That's what happened here with Agrippa. He didn't want the gospel. Bernice didn't want the gospel. Festus didn't want the gospel. They turned away. They didn't want to hear anymore. Well, God determined that. They were hardened in their sin. And they would be left without excuse. But at the same time, on the other hand, God uses the preaching of the gospel to save, to deliver from the power of unbelief and to bring people into the knowledge of the truth. It saves. The reprobate ungodly will continue to reveal their hatred and their hardness of heart. They will fill up the cup of iniquity and bring the day of Jesus Christ ever more quickly. That's what God determines through preaching, through witnessing. It happens. But you see then that this is a good desire, a worthy effort. God's, rather Paul's, Example is worthy of imitation. It begins with a desire. I would to God that you were as I were, as I am. And so I ask again, do you? Do we? That unbeliever, maybe right next door to us, that wicked person at work, that wicked student maybe at Grand Valley, do we desire that that one who God puts on our path is like we are? Is that our desire? It's a terrible thing if we don't care. If, if we can see that if there's no turning, they're on the path that leads to hell, and we don't care. There's no love there, no love for the neighbor. We'll let him go. We'll let her go. That's a dreadful thing. We have to have this desire before God. Again, says the canons, pray for them. Take the word humbly to them and pray that God will use it, that he will use it to change a man, to turn a man. Pray that. It's a good prayer. You're not praying for the salvation of the whole wide world. Of course not. You're praying for that one right in front of you. And of course, always we say, if it is thy will, of course. That's understood. What's the desire? That's the thing I'm talking about here. Do we even pray it? And after having prayed, then do it, people of God. Help that neighbor that God puts in front of you, a visitor to church, someone at work, someone in the neighborhood, whatever, whom God puts on your path. Take the opportunity to witness to the truth. God approves of the attitude. God proves of the witness, and He will use it however He sees fit. Amen. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank Thee for Thy word of truth, for the instruction of Thy word, and above all, for the glorious salvation that is ours in Jesus Christ. And it is our firm desire that we be witnesses to that truth. So may it be. And use the preaching of the gospel and our own lives as thou hast determined them for the gathering of the church 
of Jesus Christ. In his name we pray, amen.